Good, good evening, everyone. My name is Laurel Lukashevsky, and I will be the moderator for this evening's program. Um, just a quick few notes. Um, we are recording this session, and um, we are asking that if you would please keep your video camera off. Um, that way you're not accidentally um, recorded um, in the video. Um, we're not going to be highlighting of any of the um, participants, but we just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. And so just to remove any question about it, just go ahead and turn your video off. Um, and I believe everyone should be muted. So um, hopefully that won't be an issue. Um, we are going to record this and it will be posted to the Japan Information and Culture Center um, YouTube channel in the near future. So if you miss anything that you'd like to go back and see or you want to share it with friends, um, please check out the JICC um, YouTube channel um, in the near future to do that. Um, well, to get started, thank you so much for joining us for the third and final program in our series, The Art of Sakeware Treasures from Gifu and Iwate Prefectures. On Monday, we visited Gifu Prefecture and learned about Minoyaki, an eclectic and diverse pottery tradition. On Wednesday, we visited Joboji Town in Ninohe City in Iwate Prefecture, where we learned about an over 3,000 year old tradition of Joboji Urushi lacquer and lacquerware, along with a visit to Nambu Bijin, one of the world's leading sake breweries. As we start our program tonight, we'd like to have a few words from the Embassy of Japan. Please welcome Minister Shinichi Saida. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Saida, uh, Minister of uh, Embassy of Japan. Uh, on behalf of the whole embassy in, in Washington, I'd, uh, as a co-sponsor, I'd like to extend all of you uh, our warm, warm welcome to our third round of webinar on the art of sakeware treasures from Gifu and Iwate. At the outset, uh, I'd like to renew our gratitude uh, to uh, the other participants of our previous rounds on uh, Minoyaki pottery, as well as uh, Johoji lacquerware, and particularly uh, Totoki San, uh, Toki City, uh, Gifu Pre Prefectural Government, artists and masters from Tajimi and Toki for uh, the, the Gifu part, as well as uh, Ninohe City Office, uh, Tekiseisha, and Nambu Bijin san uh, for our uh, Iwate part. Uh, let me also thank uh, in advance uh, all the panelists uh, of uh, today's round table. Uh, Tomomi Miyajima of uh, Tokyo, Japan has coordinated our GIF part by networking local Minoyaki experts and made tremendous contributions to our display at JICC. Chizuko Shinkawa uh, from uh, Sake Discoveries as well as uh, Atsushi Semimoto-san uh, from Focus America Corp. Uh, they have shown the attractiveness of Iwate's lacquerware making and sake with their beautiful videos. Today, I'm really excited and really looking forward to learn from their respective expertise and their own personal stories. In closing, I sincerely wish an enjoyable and successful event today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Saida. Next, we would like to introduce Ms. Yuko Kaifu, the president of Japan House LA, our supporter for this series. Thank you, Laurel. Hello, everyone. Hello from sunny Los Angeles. I'm Yuko Kaifu, and I'm the president of Japan House Los Angeles. I wish to thank the Embassy of Japan to give us the opportunity to be part of this wonderful program. 
In the last two webinars, I myself enjoyed learning so much about both Minoyaki from Gifu Prefecture and Jobodi Lacquerware from Iwate Prefecture and their regional sake. Please direct your attention to the screen. The mission of Japan House is to communicate the best of Japan to the rest of the world in wide ranging areas from art and culture to technology, innovation, fashion, architecture, um, and uh, films, and, and of course, food. Minoyaki, Jobo de Lacaware, and sake from both regions are indeed among the best of Japan. As you can see, Japan House Los Angeles is located in the heart of Hollywood, and we do have a gallery, library, event hall, and spaces for shop and restaurant. We provide visitors with experiences of Japan with the five senses to see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. While our facilities are currently closed due to the pandemic, and we shifted to online programming since last March, we're hoping to reopen and resume our on-site and in-person activities in the near future. And we love to feature Minoyaki and uh, Joboji Lakaware and uh, there, of course, regional sake and uh, food at the uh, Hollywood location, so that many of you would be able to come and experience them with your five senses. I'm personally looking forward to today's roundtable. Thank you again, and I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kaifu. Um, to get started, Please note, if you have any questions, please send them to us via the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We may pick a few questions as we go, but we will also make time at the end of the program to um, answer questions as well. Um, tonight, we will host a roundtable discussion with three individuals who have made it their mission to share their love and passion for Minoyaki, Joboji Urushi Lacquerware, and Sake here in the United States. Our three guests are Tomomi Miyajima, the owner of Tokyo Japan, a small shop on New Street in downtown DC that specializes in minoyaki pottery, kimono, and other crafts and arts from rural parts of Japan. She works very closely with the local government in Gifu to promote its arts and handicrafts. Chizuko Nikawa Helton is owner of the consulting company Sake Discoveries LLC, which focuses on increasing sake fans in the United States. Chizuko san was awarded the title Sake Samurai in 2012 and is one of the top sake sommeliers in the United States. Atsushi Simoto founder and president of Focus America Corporation and owner of its e-commerce shop, Santoku NYC, features kitchen products made in Japan, including ceramics like Minoyaki, Jobo Urushi lacquerware, barware, chef knives, among other items. To begin, I'd love our guests to tell us a little bit about their professional path to the companies they own today. All of you have had previous careers before your current roles. I'd like to ask each of you to give us a quick glimpse at how you got to where you are today. Tomomi-san, I understand you have a PhD in education and worked as an educator and then an international, at an international organization before starting Tokyo Japan. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Hi, thank you so much, Laurel and everybody. Hi, everyone. So good to see you all. Uh, thanks for coming back for this evening. Uh, in my, sorry, just a little comment to the audience. It's just, uh, it's an honor to be here. And then uh, in the previous session, when I was moderating the whole session, I didn't have the mental room to go through the participants. And so now I'm sort of able to see those names and face. And so I see some familiar names. And so thank you for connecting. And thank you also for posting lots of comments and questions. I got the record from the tech team. So I hope I have the chance to address your questions and comments later on. But th sorry, Robert, back, okay. back, on, back to you. I just wanted to say thank you to the audience. Uh, so yes, yes, I, um, 
I would say, yes, uh, my background, I think pretty much throughout my career, I've been engaged in education and human development uh, in one way or another. I used to be a school teacher in Gifu, taught at special education uh, school for children with special needs. And then I got the PhD in education and then I joined the Iran national organization uh, working for the children in conflict affected countries and fragile states in the Middle East and Africa. So yes, what I'm doing now may seem completely different but to me, it's all coherent or just like connecting all these dots because I do also deliver uh, lessons and workshops to the local children in DC, Maryland, Virginia area. And then, you know, those art and craftsmanship in rural Japan is after all, it's all about nurturing the next generation and then right. the skills development of those artisans and craftsmanship. So to me, everything is coherent and connected. So uh, yeah, but uh, thanks for asking those questions. Thank you. Right. Oh, sure. Thank you very much. Um, next, I'm going to speak with Tizuko-san. Um, I was fascinated to learn that you grow, grew up in a 400 year old Buddhist temple in Akita, Japan, and that for a long time, you did not actually think you liked sake because it was an old man's drink. Can you tell us what changed your perspective and how you ended up where you are today? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Lolelson. Thank you so much for the, a great introduction about me. Um, well, yeah, as I said, <laughs> as you said, <laughs> and, <laughs> yes, I grew up really old, traditional, early, you know, this very, very small, tiny village size of a uh, small town called Hojisatomachi in Akita uh, Prefecture. It's really, you know, surrounded by, by lots of mountains. Yeah, there are only the rice fields, you know, it's mountains, just nature's, no entertainment there. And I was a daughter of the temple and my entertainment was almost nothing there. So I really wanted to move out, you know, the, my hometown as soon as I could. So, but, you know, especially when I was a kid, you know, so many you know, grown ups, all the people enjoyed the sake and like, drank, you know, in the temple after the funeral or, you know, those kind of ceremonies. I've seen that kind of scenes all the time. So I was kind of sick of it. Wow, grown ups are crazy, you know, and it smells kind of funny. <laughs> so I didn't have much kind of good, you know, the image for mm -hmm. sake at the time. Then I moved to Tokyo when I was college, then I for the college. And, you know, still, you know, it's, I want to be a city girl, you know, the Tokyo city girl in Tokyo. I was trying to kind of forget about the, my home, you know, countryside life, <laughs> country girl life. But, you know, I, after the graduate college, I went into, uh, I, I got, became the fashion designer. I was working for the fashion industry and I became a fashion designer. And I still, you know, they enjoying that kind of still life. But I got a phone call one day and my father got serious sick and going to die in six months. You know, he is a Buddhist monk, you know. So I went back to Akita hometown and I took care of my father, you know, the few months. But after that, I, you know, the, my father passed away and I realized that how stupid I was, why I didn't respect, you know, this beautiful, you know, the beautiful nature surrounded by lots of nature. This hometown is amazing. There are mm. tons of beautiful, the natural source, water, rice, vegetables, even just mm. tap water is so clean, so mm. tasty. So I was so, you know, mad at my, myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I started, you know, the, you know, the, the, I decided to study about something, you know, the beautiful, the kind of related to Akita Prefecture, my hometown. It mm. was rice, water, means sake. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. yeah, that's the kind of my kind of start, learn sake. Oh, that's, a, that's amazing. It's sort of, you had to go away to come back and exactly. appreciate it. Exactly. Oh. Well, Atsushi-san, um, let's 
get on to your introduction. I understand you initially worked for the Japanese government, um, working on promoting trade and investment, both in Malaysia and then in New York, before discovering a love of Japanese products. What made you decide to leave government and pursue your passion with, with Japanese arts and crafts and goods like that? Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, before I started my business here in New York 2012, I used to work for, uh, as Lawrence I introduced, um, I was working for Japanese uh, governmental trade organizations. And one, one of our main role was to promote Japanese small companies uh, or helping their uh, exporting efforts. So I was helping by uh, helping them by uh, organizing Japan Pavilion at trade shows. Mm -hmm. And at the trade shows, American buyers came to Japan Pavilions. And everyone said, oh, wonderful or oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. But after the show, so because of maybe communications or logistics issues, so most of the cases are gone. So nothing happened after that, even though buyers wanted to import. And buyers sometimes ask us because of the organizer of the pavilions, like uh, I, I contacted Japanese companies, but nothing, no replies. So I was frustrated and I wanted someone to be in between to help to breach mm. relations. So I was just hoping, but wait, 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 I can do that. I thought so. <laughs> and it, it's actually a long story, but I make it short. And sometimes I was in the, um, the exhibitors booth and try to help their like a communication sometimes be because their interpreter is not there, was not there that I had to help. And sometimes I try to explain how good it is and I touch those, uh, their products. Literally, I touch their products and I thought, oh, I like this. Mm -hmm. So that's why I started to uh, my business like nine years ago and to be uh, kind of uh, to play a role of function uh, to connect Japan manufacturer and American market consumers or retail stores. That's why I started my job. Oh, that's wonderful. Actually, I have a quick question for you. Was there any one like object that really just you just fell in that was the thing that just made you fall in love with the, the idea of helping Americans for like learn about the product? Uh, the products? Mm -hmm. Like, was there one that just oh, really yeah. struck you? Uh, okay, right before I started my business, uh, it was the year of uh, um, the big earthquake mm. oh, happened like a year of 2011. And at that time, I we we at that time we had the kind of uh, try to contribute their um, like uh, their effort to coming coming back to normal uh, life, and we form uh, like a tall region mm -hmm. uh, pavilions at the uh, Chicago Home Show. It was my first time, uh, so uh, today's theme as well, Jobo Jirakawe. Ah. And I visited uh, Iwate Prefecture and um, Miyagi Prefecture and the Fukushima Prefecture to see all those um, exhibitors. And mm -hmm. the Joboji people are one of them. And uh -huh. I didn't know by then about the Joboji Rushi as well. So. And I was fascinated. And it was right after the earthquake. Mm -hmm. And after I visited, maybe three or four months later, I started my company. Ah, oh, that's great. That's, that's really cool. Well, now I, 
I appreciate all three of you sharing sort of the start of your story. And um, I wanted to go back to, um, to Momi-san and ask her how specifically, how did you become interested in Minoyaki and the um, artifacts from um, the arts and crafts in Gifu Prefecture? Sure, yes. Um, well, thanks for the question. Uh, th for those who watched the first session of this webinar, uh, you've seen the beauty and charm of Gifu Prefecture. I'm from Gifu, I'm from Toki City, which is well known for the long history and tradition of Minoyaki pottery making. So I was born and raised there. And my family has a business in pottery making for, and my brother is the seventh generation kilo master. So they're still uh -huh. there. But so I was, you know, I grew up just being surrounded with those ceramic art or pottery for daily use. It was only, you know, it's just part of my life. But I lost my parents when I was a baby. Uh, I lost my mother when I was a baby and my father at the age of 10. So I was raised by my grandparents and my older two brothers. And I had lots of support from non-family members, from the village people, you know, mm. teachers and social workers. So it's only natural to me that I feel that I have to give back to my own community. So it's not like, <laughs> I mean, I'm not forcing myself, but it just right. came naturally after traveling all over the world through the privilege of working for the international organization. I thought, you know, it's maybe it's time to go back to my own roots. So that's how I sort of <laughs> got uh, engaged in this. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sure. Um, I'm curious for all three of our panelists, um, have you faced any challenges um, when trying to introduce either sake or lacquerware the, um, or pottery here in the United States? What challenges have you faced? I'm, I imagine there have been some. Um, so I'd love to hear, hear what, what you've encountered. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I think everybody loves sake, right? Yeah. <laughs> so if I may, I'll be brief. <laughs> but so, you know, after the first session on Monday evening, when I was going through the feedback and comments mm -hmm. from the audience, most of the people answered on the first question or second question of the survey that they didn't know about Minoyaki at all before mm. joining this session. So that shows some reality. I think not many people knows about this culture product. It was well, not even in Japan. So, you know, it's widely distributed, it's widely used, but people are not aware that this is Minoyaki because it's not uh, branded or advertised that way. So that's the initial challenge that just mm. to to get people know about this uh, culture and tradition and products. So <laughs> I'm still struggling, but I think the community is growing, at least in DC area. So I'm very thankful, but yes. So Chizuko-san, how, yes. how about yourself and with sake, have you had any challenges um, introducing it to the United States? Well, actually, luckily when I moved to uh, moved in New York, I think 15, 16 years ago. Luckily, I got a great op job opportunity as a sake sommelier for mm -hmm. the uh, really super famous sake restaurant in New York called the Sakagura restaurant. I was mm -hmm. surprised because their sake list was already over 200 kinds of sake there. Wow. So, and then some sake is actually, you know, the many sake are really difficult to get into, even in Tokyo but it's, it was here. So I thought that, wow, sake is really popular here. And the, you know, New York is, must be, you know, the better place, you know, the more, much more, you know, people know about sake more than, you know, the, the people in Japan, actually, I thought. But I think just, I realized that just few places like that, mm. not other, other, especially if you go other states, it's people don't know anything about sake. Mm. But yeah, and then I learned a lot, you know, the how to approach the customers, you know, the when I was working at the restaurant as a sake some, because I used to be a fashion designer. I didn't have any <laughs> skill or, you know, the knowledge about the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. But luckily, you know, 
that my fashion business experience helped me, you know, wow, today your, you know, your shirt is so cool. Wow, I love your color. Then I always check the customers, you know, the outlook, <laughs> you know, the fashion. Oh, this person must like this type of sake. Mm. Oh, this label is really stylish and so far, you know, sophisticated style sake. I think this person, this customer must love. Or it's kind of always kind of reach to the, you know, the people, mm -hmm. you know, who have kind of, you know, the mutual sense of taste. I always kind of catch the taste and then I, mm -hmm. I approach the customers. And now I'm challenging the, the many people not outside New York, you know, and now I'm doing at the year, you know, me and my assistant, you know, Jessica Jolly, Miss Sake USA, <laughs> she's listening here, but we are trying to reach to, you know, especially the COVID happened, we are reached mm -hmm. to the people out of New York who we never reached to before mm -hmm. um, because now we have, you know, the Zoom or online seminar we can do. So, you know, but I can tell many people are really interested in sake, but they have no idea about sake yet, many people. So as much as, as you know, the easy words we are trying to use to, mm -hmm. you know, them to understand. That's okay. kind of, yes, big challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Atsushi san, have you had have you had challenges yourself? Uh, yeah, yes, every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, the my challenge is um, I'm carrying mostly kitchen items. Mm -hmm. Kitchen item is somehow uh, related to lifestyles. So Japan and US very much different lifestyle. Like uh, Japanese people eat rice, but American people does don't eat like rice. Rice. Am I pronouncing well? <laughs> that, that was good. Rice. <laughs> rice. Yes. <laughs> um, not much, right? So a uh, Japanese kitchen item is very specialized for eating rice mm. and soup. So that kind of uh, difference are here. And like a uh, Jobo Jurakaware, the first time we brought to New York and we had the kind of uh, promotional events together with Nino Hesse City uh, government. And we had a party in Ambas, a uh, reception party at the ambassador's house in New York. And it's, it's very, <laughs> um, after the party, so we, we tried to like, uh, uh, display a uh, sake, sake cup, mm -hmm. taste the kind of a feeding of sake cup. And we prepare a lot because uh, the guests are a lot. And after the party, we, we found that 26 sake cup were missing. <laughs> oh no. Even though uh, we uh, prepared a gift bag mm. and uh, in the gift bag, uh, there was a sake cup, but, and one guest asked me, can I have three more sake cup? <laughs> and that's our start. And we change. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see this, uh, my background, there is the uh, uh, Urushi trees. So we brought Urushi tapas to New York mm -hmm. to explain and um, demonstrate how how precious this raka wear is because it takes 10 to 15 years to grow mm -hmm. and only one season you can take the sap and from one tree you can get only six ounces of sap wow. and this this particular bowl you have to uh, paint polish and dry six times for four months then you can buy this bowl, hundred dollars. So that kind of backstories mm -hmm. we had to tell. The, after that, people never asked, can I use dishwasher kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But before that, it, is that dishwasher safe kind of questions? Always we are asked. Mm. But, so our challenge is uh, always we have to like uh, explain backstories mm -hmm. or cultural difference so that right. maybe uh, American consumers can understand 
the value of uh, Japanese items. Right. Well, one of the, of course, with this whole series, we're talking about sake and sake wear. And I know that I'm, I'm sure that the people that are listening are very curious about just learning a little bit about sake and the best way to have sake with, you know, is it hot or cold? Should you, you know, should you drink, can you drink the same sake? Is it only certain sakes you drink hot and only certain sakes you drink cold? And of course, since we're talking about the artistry of sake as well, it's like, I, I, I imagine, and I don't know this for sure, but I'm thinking perhaps sake is somewhat similar to wine where you use different glasses depending on the wine and it brings out different flavors and, and essences of, of whatnot. So I'm guessing, because I know I've seen sake cups that are very wide and I've seen sake cups that are thin. I've seen clay that's very thick and very thin. Um, so I would love, oh, look at that. So Tomomi has a great sample. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Tomomi? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so I have, this is just a part of my whole collection. Wow. But as Laurel Sun said, you know, even with the pottery or the ceramic or porcelain, it comes in different shapes and sizes and styles and materials. So um, which one? So for instance, you know, um, if this is, I think Chizuko-san can fill me in late, but, uh, you know, depending on the, the shape or the feel, because lips are one of the most sensitive organs of your body. And then as you have seen in the first webinar on Monday evening, those artists put a lot of effort how to make it, mm -hmm. you know, user-friendly and gentle to your lips. But for instance, there are many different things, but for instance, if it's the hirahai, the flat one, it just, you don't need to tilt your head like a tequila shot, as opposed to those, you know, straight ones, the tall ones, you have to tilt your head in order to get your liquid and it goes straight to your throat. So, but as opposed to this style, for instance, this is really mild and it, the liquid, the sake would come into your mouth gently without, you know, tilting your head too much. And then it goes around your tongue. So this is just an example. So each has its own character and its own uh, way of enjoying the sake, depending on the kind uh, mm -hmm. but, and occasion. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's fun to look into it. But yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, well, thank you. And I know Chizuko-san, Chizuko I think yes. you also have, I think you also have quite a collection of mm -hmm. sake serving utensils. Can you introduce people to maybe a couple of your favorite ones and okay. tell us how you use them? Okay, so I have, of course, I have a minoyaki and ceramic one too, but as Tomomi said, you know, this type of flat cup, yes, as she said, it's really, you know, it's really mild, so gentle, it comes into the mouth. And also this type of uh, the hirahai, the flat, uh, flat one, you can enjoy more aroma. Ah, okay. So I highly recommend to have daiginjo or ginjo or a little kind of, you know, the delicate like a flowery or fruity notes. Those type of lighter body type of sake is great with the hirahai. And this type of a little thicker, mm -hmm. you know, the type of uh, the, uh, the ceramic one, it's if you drink a little more kind of Jumai or Honjozo, a little more kind of full body style sake, especially, you know, that you can enjoy a little room temperature or a slightly warm, a little more hot. Those type of sake is really, really kind of, you know, it's you can enjoy like, it's kind of a small cup of kind of hot milk. <laughs> it's really easy to, you know, enjoy the aroma and the flavor of the full body one. And for the Urushi Rakawear, my, of course, I have Hirahai, the Urushi mm. version. So this is Joboji Urushi, yes. So yesterday, uh, the, 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 the Joboji Urushi, the seminar the other day, you know, Double Vision, Yuzo-san explained that, oh, uh, he recommended to have uh, the, the cold sake with the Urushi cup is better, he said. But you know, I can't tell. Any temperature is great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, actually Joboji Urushi is, 
is really strong material. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. yes, of course, you know, the over 80 degrees is like a 160, 70, you know, that kind of hot, hot one, extremely hot is a little too much, but mm -hmm. you know, it's like uh, 120, 140, you know, something like that. It's totally fine with the Urush cup and with the shape, you know, the sake cup, so many, you know, it's a little kind of small sake cup size is something mm -hmm. like that, but you know, this type of small cup, you have to pour, you know, many mm -hmm. times. Right, right. So my favorite cup is a little bigger version. Uh -huh. <laughs> so this one is really, you know, actually, I can, uh, I can drink with this type of cup. Mm -hmm. And when I woke up, I drink coffee. Oh. And yes, hot coffee. And daytime, I drink water or cold tea room temperature water and you know the later night sometimes i drink cold sake and hot sake sometimes shochu on the rocks mm -hmm. sometimes whiskey <laughs> so it's any type of alcohol is fine mm -hmm. and the great thing is about urushi you can enjoy you know the material and the getting to change a little bit little bit little by little mm -hmm. and a little bit shinier and shinier that's the urushi's great part too character too Oh, that's just fascinating. I think it makes me want to try it. Is there, um, are there any questions from the audience? If there are, you can put them in the chat box and we'll try to, um, to ask our um, panelists as well. So if you have any specific questions, um, please let us know. Um, I, and I think- um, Are we calling Lisa? I should, I should take it off. I don't know what that was. Um, oh, there, here's a question. It says, is there something equivalent to tea drinking ceremony for sake? Is there a formal, is there a ritual? Yes, it's sometimes, you know, the sake is served at the, uh, the serious tea, tea ceremony too. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh -huh. Well, thanks for the question. Um, I also had so many questions that I was not able to answer at the previous mm. session. So uh, you can keep sending the questions, uh, but uh, in the meantime, may I start with the <laughs> remaining questions, if that's okay. But for that question, I would say the sake has like so many, like for thousand years of history or longer mm -hmm. and then it always developed together with the religious rituals or Shinto rituals or we still today we drink sake in the very special occasion like at the wedding in the traditional Japanese ceremony style and also to pray for the the land or to the god of land when you build a new house mm -hmm. You know, you have those all kinds of rituals and ceremonies, and they would always serve sake to the god mm -hmm. and then to the people, to the community. So it has been always part of our lives. And then sake has been playing the central role in any kind of ceremony. Right. So, right. Yeah. Actually, one question that did pop up here before you get to yours is because this is a question I know I've had and I've had friends ask too is what is the best food pairing for sake? And I'm just curious, I think, I know it's very broad, um, but maybe tell us your favorite pairing. If each of you has a favorite pairing of food with sake and what type of sake that is. Who wants to go? Should I, should I answer for it? Please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you know, the people might think that, oh, sake is supposed to be paired with Japanese food only, like sushi or sashimi, but that's not true. You know, you can enjoy any food from all over the world. For example, nigori sake, it's cloudy sake. That white one, the milky one, mm -hmm. that one is great with Indian curry. <laughs> yeah, spicy food too. That, oh, that, yeah. You know, the Thai food is a really great combination. Sometimes ju juicy, a little unpasteurized namazake has a little kind of sweetness too, a little fruity notes too. So it's great with a spicy food, like a Thai food. Mm. For example, like daiginjo, ginjos, those type of a little, you know, the light body 
a little, you know, those type of dedicated style sake, of course, great with sashimi or sushi, but you can try, you know, the, uh, the uh, carpaccio, something, you know, the appetizers, the olive oil or something a little, you know, it's kind of lighter body, to, you know, the, light, the appetizer type of food too. And another interesting one, blue cheese with daikin chow. This combination really? is great, great too. So cheese, if I, you know, if you have something light flavor, you know, the mozzarella, or you know, the, with the uh, some little olive oil and tomato, that that, that type of like cheese is great with a little ginjo style sake. Mm. And also, you know, funky mimolet or something little, you know, the rich flavor cheddar, you know, the sharp cheddar, that kind of cheese with a little more full body, kimoto, Yamaha, or something old fashioned classic sake. So it's, it depends on the temperature too. So you can find anything, you can try any type of sake with any uh, type of food. Oh, very cool. Uh, this, this is very, this just came up and I think it's sort of interesting. Um, someone asked what the impact of climate change is on the joboji urushi trees have they had any issues has has there been like with the sustainability of the trees atsushi do you know sorry i have no idea but yeah, no um, idea. Mm. normally warmer climate is better for the plant or trees right mm -hmm. but are they, uh, are no they nothing particular happened but recently in japan as well um yeah, heavy rains, like a storm. Uh, I think more than before, that, that's for sure, yeah. Mm. Does, for, um, uh, I don't know, Are, were there some questions, Tomomi-san, that you were really wanted to get to that were from the earlier? Yeah, so I'm just uh, going through the current questions, but I yeah. guess, but, let me oh thank you for all these good questions but in any really case uh, i got the chat record from the session as well as the uh, questions posted through the survey but unfortunately i don't have a way to reach each person so mm -hmm. if you have any particular burning question for instance somebody emailed me asking if is there any apprenticeship opportunity currently being accepted in those kilns in Tokyo mm. City. So those, if you have any specific personal questions, because I don't have, I don't know how to reach each one of you, although I see your names and questions. So could you uh, email me if you have any burning questions that needs to be definitely answered, please. I just typed my email uh, to the chat box. But in general, if I go through the general questions from the previous session, I think many people are sort of worried how to use those Japanese mm. precious art or crafts. It's, it's for daily use, I assure you, Minoyaki, um, unless you see those gold or metallic rims mm -hmm. or any shiny part uh, in the, the painting, it's safe for the microwave and dishwasher. Mm. And uh, also it's advised by those kilo masters. When you get those uh, pottery, you see those cracks in it mm -hmm. or on the surface, you know, that means this one is still breathing. So you see those air holes and some cracks. It's not the uh, um, flow. It's, it's part of the beauty, but this can absorb water and moist very easily. So please do not soak those into water too long. It's, it's fine for dishwasher, but once it's dry, please put it out and let it breathe again. Otherwise it might uh, leave some stain, but still, you know, it's natural because I, I drink tea and sometimes wine. Sorry for the wine expert, it's not right, but with those teacup from mm. Minoyaki and then it does leave some stain in it but we also say that it's the keshiki the landscape and we mm. nurture the pottery so that they do so we foster and then we grow older together with those products so don't 
worry too much about getting it dirty, <laughs> but if you want to uh, keep it uh, clean and pristine as much as possible, they also recommend that you boil it first with the hot water. So some of the, the air holes can be uh, filled. And we actually traditionally boil it before using it with the, the remain of the rice water. We, we drain the rice before cooking rice. And then this is perfect for boiling the pottery so that all the cracks are filled. So it wouldn't leave too much stain. So those are some practical tips. I hope it's useful for some of you because I got quite many questions how <laughs> best to use the pottery. It's not, it's not the art piece, it's for your daily use. So, but thanks for the question. That's great. Actually, and that's something, it's, this is an interest because all of you are working with traditional, um, you know, practices in Japan, whether it's sake making or pottery or lacquerware. And um, this one question was, it someone was referring to our program on Wednesday, asking it saying that it sounded like the Urushi um, industry was in decline. And I think um, with Japan's, you know, declining population and people moving out of rural areas, I'm, I'm curious what the impact has been on these traditional um, traditional um, arts and crafts and and both in the sake too and how how is that being dealt with anyone I think you know what we can call the Odashiba san the Urushi, Urushi craftsman here actually mm. he's listening to here so Odashiba san oh yeah <laughs> I think he can answer the best answer for that, especially the Urushi. Ah, Sashima there he is. Nana-san. Otashima-san. Let me see, he's, yes. he needs to be unmuted. Okay. Otashima-san, mute, okay. Ah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Nana-san, you can hear me? Nana-san. Can you? Okay. Could you ask him? Sure. Can I speak in Japanese to explain to Mr. Odashima? Yes. That's right. Yes. 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 まあ、<笑> It's, it's a really difficult um, question to answer, uh, but the, uh, we're just trying to tackle the uh, issues that we can see just right in front of us uh, at this moment. There's not really like a long term, um, the uh, challenge that the goals that we're specifically going after, but it's, it's a really hard um, question to answer. <laughs> May I also come in because the issue is common no? in Minoyaki industry. Yes, please. Yeah, so it's completely the same issue probably for many other arts and crafts in rural Japan that, uh, you know, the sales and productions and import export, it's been declining mm -hmm. uh, So for so many reasons. And then we are losing those skills and craftsmen because of the rapid aging of those workers. And then, uh, you know, um, so the industry itself is shrinking with so many challenges, maybe the mm -hmm. decrease in the natural resources, mm -hmm. those trees and all these clay and minerals, it's, it's in decline. And then as well as the size of the market, both domestically and internationally. So, and then the, the market is shifting for, in the case of Minoyaki, they, we used to export a lot to the US and Europe. It still is, but we are shifting 
to more like Asia because、mm. they have more emerging economies, they have the population growth. So we have to adapt to those changes. But it's really a persistent challenge that we keep losing those、um, newcomers coming into the industry to take on those skills and craftsmanship because it takes. You know, many decades of apprenticeship, and then it's not、right. always financially rewarding. So it's the challenge. It all across the board in any、mm. sort of craft making in rural Japan.、Mm. And the, can I answer the question also? Yes, please. Yeah,、um, with regards to urushi, so、um, authentic Japanese urushi、um, used in Japan. Uh, market share is very little, like a like a three percent.、Uh, means imported lacquer,、uh, even Japanese manufacturer or producers or artisans using、uh, international foreign urushi.、Uh-huh. So joboji,、um, just now Odashima-san was stepping.、Um, Is that small little tiny town, but、uh, produce seventy percent of Japanese urushi? Wow! So, well, understand. So, three、uh, percent of share is、mm-hmm. genuine made in Japan urushi sap, and this three percent out of three percent, seventy percent of、uh, urushi is、uh, from Jobos town, and only thirty.、Wow. Tapers, and and we found I I learned that the history of urushi in Japan, like、uh, we found the what do you call、um, the ancient accessories in Hokkaido,、mm-hmm. which was nine thousands years ago, nine thousand year years ago, so already there was the lacquerware in Japan. So almost ten thousand year history is all, all. So it's really little. So can be like a like a flame on the candle.、Mm. So、uh, the government also are、uh, trying to promote Japanese urushi. Now、um, national treasure like a shrine and temple, you know、uh, Kyoto. Uh, Golden Pagoda or Nikko Toshogu、uh, Grand Gate、um, uh, repaired by、uh, Joboji Urushi. They, they, they set up the rule you have to use Japanese Urushi to repair the kind of thousand or several hundred、uh, year old、uh, cultural heritage. So, and what I saw in Joboji. I visited Joboji town、uh, several times, and now even、uh, urushi tapa or craftsman like、uh, painting or coating urushi.、Uh, many younger generations、uh, came in,、mm. and I learned how to tap the urushi from the trees from a young lady. How to tap the urushi? So, I think even though the、um, the market share of uh, all, uh, the urushi culture is uh, uh, declining, but、uh, some hope, like a、mm. younger generation came in, and、um, UNESCO also uh, uh, recognized uh, this cultural heritage as an intangible. While the heritage, like a cultural heritage, so that's the good news for even Japanese to know this precious、um, culture and the history. So, yeah, I think that's the good news, and to con- keep continue this、uh, our heritage from ten、uh, thousand years ago. Right. Thank you. That's that's hopeful, definitely, and it's such a beautiful, beautiful art form.、Um, There is there was one more question in the chat that has to do with sake, and I think it's an interesting one just because it's a question I've always had too.、Um, 
this, it says, I would say that most Americans who go to a Japanese restaurant order hot sake. When I go to a Japanese market, most of the sake for sale is recommended to be had cold. Um, is it similar in Japan or different? Well, it's different actually. Is you it? know, that somehow, you know, that many people, especially in the, you know, the, I was surprised when I moved in here, you know, so many places, the restaurants, you know, the sake, the menu is no name cold or hot, right. <laughs> no name of the, you know, the sake. So, wow, sake is uh, two choices. So, but same sake, hot or cold, you know, luckily I got a great restaurant to work with, but, right. you know, the many restaurants, you know, it's still something like that. I don't see much the kind of restaurants anymore, mm -hmm. but still, you know, the one of the typical questions about sake is sake serve, is supposed to be served chilled or hot, they're chilled or hot, cold or hot. Okay, uh, you know, I can't say both, you know, up to you, you know, your mm. preference. So, you know, some sake is great for chill mm. and some sake is great for warm, but actually many sake is great for both temperature, chilled ah. or warm too. So it's totally up to you, your preference. Just one thing is to say, you know, some a little delicate, a little flowery, delicate type of expensive daiginjo sake, those of type sake, I highly recommend to have enjoy the beautiful notes, like a flowery, fluty notes. So mm -hmm. you can enjoy chill with wine glass wear. That's a safer uh... way. And then some people think, oh, you know, I don't have sake cups, you know, at home, so I can't drink sake. No, don't worry. You know, many people have wine glass wear, so you can <laughs> enjoy wine glass wear too. So, and then, you know, you can little by little, if you are interested, collecting, you know, your, you know, the favorite style of sake cups, and then you can mm. enjoy the texture and difference between the wine glassware, same sake, but it's so completely different between, mm. you know, wine glassware and it depends on materials, urushi or minoyaki or, you know, and also shape is different. Mm. And then, you know, as Tomomi-san uh, the, uh, the explained earlier, a little bit kind of, you know, short glass type of sake or a little taller type of sake, you know, the glass, uh, the, uh, the shape of the cup. This type of cup is a little, tastes a little bit kind of sharper, you know, mm. and even same sake, you know, it's, you can, you can feel, oh, it tastes so different, much drier and much sharper, but actually it's same sake, you can enjoy a little more so flat one or wine glass where you can catch kind of hidden, beautiful, fruity notes and the more you can enjoy that little more around taste too. So how, something like that. For, I, just out of curiosity mm -hmm. too, how do you heat sake? Say that you, you decide you want a warm sake <laughs> because it's winter time. How, how would you all recommend doing that? Okay, recently I gave you a big, you know, Kanzaki seminar recently. Uh -huh. and so many people, you know, how to you know, decide the warm sake properly. But actually, I can say it's no rule. If you have, <laughs> you know, microwave, you can use it. But I just recommend to use just, you know, it's like a, if you have just pot and boiled water, mm -hmm. boiling water, and then you can, easy to say, if you don't have any specific sake caps or, you know, caps or those kind of equipment, I believe that you have, you know, the <laughs> mason jar. So you can pour sake and you can just put it in the, you know, boiled water, gently mm -hmm. warm, and then you can touch the bottom. And the, if you can touch a little bit, I think this is, you know, pot temperature still. And Thank then, you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you can try and uh, that serious equipment a little by little. So no rules. Mm. Can I, if yes. we still have time, yes, in, yes. Case, in case you happen to have the Japanese tokuri and ochoko, the most classic style from Showa period. You know, it's even more easier. You just pour the sake in it. And then as chizuko san mentioned, you just bathe them in a hot bath in a little pan. You boil water and then just soak it in until it's, you know, warm enough. But don't boil too much because it's gonna evaporate aroma and some sensitive flavor in it mm. so but and then if you don't see any uh, gold rims or metallic finish on your tokuri this is with the gold so this is not good for uh, microwave 
but unless otherwise, this is also safe to be put in the microwave, but don't put it too long, like 20, 40 seconds, and then preferably you are supposed to stir it and then, uh, you know, just test it. And then, and then I think it's also enjoyable to do it right, <laughs> like quite right. like gracefully, not like this or right. this, you know, always use both hands and quite gently. I think it's part of the entertainment, I think, you know, so it was, you know, sake where it was always part of the culture of drinking sake. Right. So that's all from me. Well, I, I think we're, we're coming close to the end of our time, but I did want to make sure that um, people could find out where they can go to buy the lacquerware, um, especially the joboji urushi and um and minoyaki and um i would i i know that people are interested in that um so if you can if you can let us know and um that would be great and sake too chizuko <laughs> anyone uh, what to buy yeah okay oh here we go yes yes so, you know, here, you know, it's a little difficult to find a Joboji Urushi in the United States, but now, you know, a little, it was very small, you know, the collect the, the selections items, but santokenyc.com, that you can find the beautiful the sake, uh, sake wear and some little, you know, nice other, other stuff too. And also, uh, if you want to learn about more Joboji Urushi, you can go to uh, the English version of Urushi the slash joboji.com mm. and also if you want to buy the sake from the the joboji urushi's hometown ninoheshiti number vision is a really delicious sake from the same region and you can find the dc sake.com and if you are living in the air outside of dc the tbc sake.com is easy to order from other states okay oh Thank you all so much. I just, this has been so much fun. And I know that I expect that- Hold on, Laura, hold on, Laura. Oh, sure. I think we have one more thing uh, to oh, address here from uh, our tech team. Just give us one second. Okay. Uh, I have a little shop at the corner of U and 17th in downtown DC. So if you are in this area, please swing by. And I also have a website. So just uh, take a look. And sorry, I think somebody posted some very specific question that I hope, I really hope to reach that person who asked about all these specific things. So mm -hmm. please do email me through the email address that I posted. Uh, so yeah. And I think too, um, I know that once again, before we close that um, we have a, we do have the survey. I think if you all have seen the survey link before, if you could give us feedback on the program, that would be wonderful because it will help us create new programs in the future. Um, and I, I think we're at almost at the end, but I just wanted to make sure that there was nothing else that any of our speakers wanted to, if there was something that we missed that we, that you wanted to share with everyone. No, and if I, not, just, I just wanted to say thank you for everybody who connected from Japan as well. It's the precious Saturday morning, their time. <laughs> I see many friends faces. So thank you. And other friends and mentors and people who came back for all these three nights. So Thank you so much for supporting those Japanese art and craftsmanship. I really look forward to seeing many of you at my store if you happen to be in DC. Well, I, I thank you all very, very much. Um, thank you to everyone who is watching and who joined us. Thank you again to our speakers, Tomomi, Tomomi Miyajima, Chizuko Nikawa, Helton, Atsushi, at Sushi Sumimoto for sharing your expertise with us this evening. And thank you again to Yugo Kaifu of Japan House LA for your support of this series. Um, it has just been a delight speaking to everyone and learning so much um, about pottery and lacquerware and sake all together. And I know that we're all looking forward to 
to trying a little bit of everything. So thank you very much again. Really appreciate your time.